Welcome to the Jim Wits Podcast. I'm Ryan George. I'm Justin Guild, a.k.a. Chef Sonic. And we are the Jim Wits. So, uh, interesting thing I've been thinking about recently based on a project that I've been doing. And I'm sure you've run into it in one way or another. So, in the movies, a very romantic idea that is touched on again and again is the protagonist's um, sort of strength and willingness to do how he or she feels, despite what other people are telling them. And a good example of this is in the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, which is a popular movie as of late. Uh, did you see that movie? Nope. All right, it's, uh, it's sort of a mediocre movie with great music in it. So that's how you can describe it. And a great performance, performance by yeah. the lead actor. Yeah. So um, there was one moment where... Uh, Freddie Mercury and his band Queen are basically being told by a record executive, no way we, you could ever release an eight-minute song or Bohemian Rhapsody, the song, and no one's going to play it and blah, 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 but they stuck to their convictions and they said, no, this is the lead single, and it goes on to be a, a smash hit and a legendary song, right? Uh, um, and a f funny thing is that the scene in that movie actually never happened. That, that record executive did not exist they never had that argument. Oh, okay. yeah. um, I'm sure people told them, hey, look, you can't have an eight-minute single, right, which is just common sense, but whatever. There are exceptions to the rule. Mm. So let's do a little reframing. And, and, and you could think of how many times in a movie is someone say, uh, they try to tell someone, you can't do this, or this is how you should do it, and the person goes against it and sticks to their how they feel, and they succeed, right? Yeah. How many times have you seen I mean, that in a movie? It's part of like the narr like a, a trope, right? It's like a narrative trope that you 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 need you know you need to fight the odds i think every story needs that and so you know i think you see that often in biopics where they kind of enhance or or really lean into you know those those situations where they're kind of defying the odds or being told they can't yeah um, and everyone yeah. likes that that story yeah. but let's do a little re well, think about it think yeah. about it. So sorry to cut you off but think about you know how often like athletes um you know, who are just naturally, you know, you take a, a high level athlete throughout their entire life, you know, from basically pre, you know, not preschool, maybe, you know, from middle school on, they have basically been the best at what they do, you know, and, and it's not until they get to the pros that maybe they're middle of the road, but even some of the best in the pros, they, they still need to act as if everyone, nobody thought they could do it. Like how often does a team win the championship when they were favored to win the championship? And then when they're interviewing like the winners, like, yeah, no one thought we could do it. Everyone was against us. Like it just happens all the time. Like yeah, people, yeah. people create that in their head, even fighters, like you'll see fighters yeah, who, yeah. who win a championship and they were, they, you know, they were like the betting favorite and they'll talk about how no one thought they could do it. No one believed in them. It was just them and their team. Uh, you, like we and every that. once in a while you get a Matt Sarah who beats GSP. Yeah. Like, who, yeah, very, exactly. who like went through back yeah. to the ultimate fight. Like that's, you a, get a true, like, that's an actual story. Yeah, you of where you get that like happened, that story. So few and far between. Exactly. But, but people need that narrative. Like they need yeah. to tell themselves that, you know, almost to, to help them, you know, it's a, it's a popular narrative. So, and look, not to take away from anyone who's achieved anything, whether they're a favorite or not, they've still had to work very hard to get where they are. That's not really what I'm getting at. The idea is let's do a little reframing where instead of the protagonist being the, the athlete or the singer or whatever it is who defies the odds and makes it, the, the protagonist is the, is the coach or the producer, or whoever it is, who's really has this best interest for this, you know, for the artist or the athlete or whoever it is to succeed. And they're giving their best advice as to how this could happen, but the artist or the athlete just doesn't want to listen. And, and in doing so, the, uh, you know, the, the, that person fails, or maybe succeeds, but fails. But like, it's interesting when you reframe it that way. And this is what I'm getting at. Basically, for a very brief description of what's happening with me, I'm working with someone 
And I really thought that some of the songs had potential. I'm a music producer, but this person just had to stick with what they were doing. And I know that it's just not going to succeed, right? And it's not like this person isn't brilliant or they're not Freddie Mercury. And it's just not that. Do I know this person? Right? Uh, maybe, okay. maybe, you know, it's right. This person just, I, I just, but I'm going to go with it because that the person likes it. And that's w- what's important. So now I'm going to ask you, have you had that situation where you really did know what was best for someone and you, you tried to steer them out of good intentions in the right direction, but they just wanted to do what they were going to do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, can, yeah. what, can you think of one that, an example that comes to mind? Um, without, I mean, there, I, there are def- plenty of examples. I mean, I, you know, I, again, I don't want to call people out. Now, if I get too specific, I think the two examples I'm thinking of are people who probably listen to the podcast. <laughs> so I don't really want to get into specifics. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, they'll okay, know. Okay, okay. But there are plenty of situations, um, you know, more benign, I guess. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. as a as a fitness person, um, you know, I often, you know, hear people talk, tell me about their goals or what they're going to do for the next few months or for the next six months. And just based on experience, I kind of know better and, you know, know that, the, yeah, that's probably not the best thing. Let's, you should probably try something else. But sometimes it's hard for them to listen. Um, I can think of a couple of projects you were involved in that, um, not you specifically, but you kind of like, you, you probably could have told the person that too. Um, there are a couple of situations. The, I mean, yeah, all the time. Maybe I did yeah. tell the person that, and they just wanted maybe, maybe to go with what they listen. wanted to do anyway. No, but yeah, but yeah, no, you're right. Like, I think I get the point. Like, you know that that I think we we're we're tuned to to kind. Of, I mean, it's a problem with the media, like, because we we're we're kind of tuned to think we're special, and that you know you just gotta you gotta go for it. And yeah, a lot you know for every one person that go, and that that's the issue. I think when you when you talk about you know, I guess I talk to people you know. When it comes to let's say politics and and kind of I'm you know we talked about it like I'm more on the liberal side I think I'm more a person who thinks that that we need some kind of a safety net and I think the issue you have sometimes um, is people will say oh you know just got a hard work you know bootstrap it and hard work and and the issue is that yes there are going to be like the you know the Steve Jobses of the world or the Bill Gates of the world even though they probably had you know had a nice little um, head start too but but you're gonna have people who pull themselves up from the ground up. And 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 kind of make it and, and are successful, but often those are the outliers. Like those are the exceptions oh, to the rule. Basically, everyone and who succeeds, you have to have some support system. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but even so, even if you get that person who really did come here with ten dollars in their pocket and became a billionaire, like it still is the exception. And so I think that, but we we get so we we become so enamored with the with that that we we tend to lose sight of the fact that yeah, there's the exceptions are there. Um, but you know, for the average person, th- they need some help or they need something. And, and, and for the average person, it's not going to work out that way. And if we tell everybody that all you got to do is, is just follow your dreams, you, you know, it's a great idea. And for some people it's great, but, but the, you know, far more, people, far more people are not successful quote following their dreams. So, you know, you kind you of have to also make follow these your dreams, but do it the right yeah. way. Yeah. Well, you have like, to kind of make these calculations. So there are going to be times where you have to kind of say, okay, look, this is a, you know, one in, a hundred chance, but I'm just, it's worth it. I, the, you know, it is worth it for me to do that. And then for others, you know, you kind of say, okay, is it worth it? If it doesn't work out, is it worth it for me? And, and, uh, yeah, I, th- I do think though that we, we get inundated with these, the, the kind of hero story and that, that kind of defying the odds story that we forget that defying the odds is really unlikely. That's why it's defying the odds. It only happens in the movies, you know? And so we'll get to the, so to the sort of point of the conversation is as a trainer, yeah. At what point, if someone is happy, even though they might not be doing it the right way, or they might not be set to achieve the, their goals, or they're just, or, or they're not, you know, you know, they could be doing better. At what point do you say, as a trainer, someone who is hired, I have to be satisfied with the fact that my client is happy? Uh, what do you mean? I'm, I'm a little. So confused. if your cl- so if your client is is happy, but maybe yeah. they're not achieving the goals they had set out no. to do. Yeah, then, they're not losing the weight they wanted to. They're not gaining the muscle, but they're ha- they seem to be genuinely happy. At what yeah. point? But you know that they're either not working hard enough, or they're just not. They're not following the program, but they're still satisfied. They're happy with what's going on, even though you know that they are not achieving what they could. At I mean, what that's point- everybody. You know, th- unless th- unless it's an athlete. Or there's a very specific goal. I think most people aren't doing what, you know, they they the most that they could. But if they're happy, then great. You know, I think if they're doing things that are self-destructive, uh, that's where I'll have a problem. But look, if if 
if I can get somebody to be consistent with exercise um, and meet their kind of weekly requirement of exercise, great. You know, look, you know, there might be other things that are self-destructive, maybe the food or, or lifestyle choices or drinking, whatever. And in those cases, you try to kind of help steer them in the right direction. But, you know, unless there is a specific goal, you you just got to do what you need to do to exercise. And so, so I'm happy if they're happy. Okay. But like I said, I think there are... You, uh, you have to think about what other life choices they're making, and uh, yeah, so right. kind of answer that. Yeah. So yeah, no, no, th- that makes sense, and it's it's a big thing that I have to come up with, t- w- uh, that I have to come to the realization too that I always want so much more for the people I work with than oftentimes what they want, yeah. and sometimes I have to just say, you know what, this person is happy, I'm just gonna roll with it because yeah. I guess that's what matters. And well, to close, if you are in that situation where. You're being you're being given advice by someone, and you just have that feeling. No, I just have to do my own thing, right? I'm not saying don't do your own thing, but really think about it. Or maybe that there's a uh, there's a, a way to, to to go about it your own way, but to take advice from people that are the experts. Now, I forgot who it w- was said, but it what it, basically the the quote was, um, "Don't tell people." what to do, but surround yourself with great people and let them do their thing and be surpri- you know, be happily surprised by the outcome of wh- what happens. So there, like some you know, great advice is to, if you have g- good people you're working with in whatever your endeavor, you, listen to them. Get the, try to get the, most, mm. get the most out of it, right? And don't, necess- don't necessarily be stubborn to do it your own way just because you want to have, because of that hero story that you've seen in the movies. And I'm not saying don't go for your dreams, but just, you know, consider all the, you know, con- consider all, all the information that's being given to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I would say more than anything, just be smart about what you're, what you choose to do. So if you're, it's true. People you know, have to make decisions based on emotion, yeah. rather than you know. Intellect. No, so I, I think that's it. Like, look, and like I said earlier, you have it, it's uh, it's up to you to make your do the kind of mental math. I think again, often we don't realize how hard it is to to be successful at, at certain things. You know, it's one thing if if you want to be a doctor, there's a very clear path to becoming a doctor. If you want to be a lawyer, there's a clear path to becoming a lawyer. If you want to be a a writer, there's a you know f- you know clear path. You know, it gets a little more muddy as far as like what what success is for you and everything. But you know, there are certain things where there's a clear path to kind of success. Um, and then there and there, but then there's certain things where there there is just very unlikely. And so you just have to take it realistically. If you decide I want to go to Hollywood and become an actor, great. You want to just be a working actor? Do you want to be famous? You know, like what what do you want to be? And and the you know you just have to know how hard it is. And be willing to deal with, you know, kind of ask yourself the question of what, what's my life like if I don't make it? And is it worth it? You know, are the, you know, is it worth the, the chance? And, and in a lot of cases it is like, you know, you, yeah, sure. If you, let's say you want to be, a, uh, you want to be in a famous band or you, you want to make it as a musician, y- you may make that decision to, to really go for it and realize that when you're done, okay, I might have to go, you know, live with my parents for a few years while I get my act back together. I might have to go back to school. And as long as you're okay with the consequences and that's fine. I, I think it's just, don't, you just go into it with a clear head. Um, to me is always the biggest thing. Cause I, I'm not saying, you know, yeah. Cause I don't like, you know, I don't want to say don't follow your dreams don't try. That should be the name of the be, podcast. Yeah, don't, don't follow, follow your, dreams, your right? dreams. But but it's just a matter of yeah. You always have to kind of be realistic. Like I, like there's a guy um, at my gym who is uh, younger than me. He's about thirty, uh, maybe thirty one, and he like really loves training. He's fought once. He wants to, he, and he's like, you know, I, I want to just give up everything and move to Thailand and, and fight and be a pro fighter. And it's like, I mean. That sounds great, and if you know, it's, if you if you want to just up and leave, great. But that you know, be be aware you're you're not you know not that you're old, but you know, at thirty, you're not getting any younger. And there are guys that are out there, 18, 17, 18, 19, who are you know who have more experience, who are going to be doing the same thing. And so you kind of have to be realistic about it. And if you want to go out there, train and fight, and just get away from our crazy you know our crazy you know heavy work focused life in the U.S., great. But don't you know? But it's kind of you want to be careful about thinking I'm going to be a pro fighter and win a ton of titles in Thailand. It's, you know, may or may not happen. So you just have to kind of like, be so, realistic. I know someone like that yeah. who's probably getting um, on the upside of of twenty, right? Probably. Yeah getting close to 30 and he wants to be a professional fighter and it's like i've trained with him and he's like he's all right he's not much better than me (laughs) like i mean maybe by now he's a little bit better but um he wants to be an mma fighter he does muay thai and and mma it's like he has not i mean he has basically no wrestling skills not very much grappling his striking is not much better than mine 
And well, if he's a heavyweight, he might have a chance. Well, yeah, yeah, no, but he's not. He is, okay. uh, in fact, he's the uh, he's a he's like a, a f- bantamweight or something oh, like that's that. Every it's yeah. like, yeah. and I, I'm just you know I, I want to encourage him, but I'm thinking for a pr- you know it's one thing you want to do this as a hobby, but as a profession, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's you, just you just uh, be realistic. And again, if you're just, just, there's yeah. people that are like yeah, there's like the, that are that are better natural athletes that are that are killers yeah. that are you know 18 right now. Yeah, so. no, younger. There are kids that are, you know, like there's a kid that came into my gym who's 14, is a monster. And, you know, like, so you got to be aware of that. And so, yeah, if you want to up, uproot yourself, great, but just be aware, you know, that of, of, of anything. So yeah. that's all. And just kind of being smart with, you know, and, and fully aware of your kind of decisions. Philosophy life lessons with yeah, the gym. Right. Yeah, who, yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to say who would have thought, but that was kind of the whole um Mission statement so initially was being a philosophy podcast. Yeah, yeah. And so the, anyway. the the moral of the story is: do not follow your dreams. <laughs> right no, now. follow your. No, no, I'm no, just no. kidding. Yeah, exactly. All right. So what do we have? Just be on smart about it. Today? Yes. Yeah. What um, do we have on top for today? All right. Uh, well, we've got we've got a couple interesting studies. I got three interesting studies actually to go through. So let's uh, we'll go through them and um, uh, tell me if you think they're interesting at all. Um, all right. So the first one is pub was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, and basically, the the gist of it was that exercise is as effective as um, medication for high, high blood pressure. So basically, um, researchers conducted a review of 391 studies um, that to- and trials that totaled al- almost 40,000 people. Um, and it was used comparing um, exercise to medicine and treating high blood pressure. And so what they found was that there were very similar results. You know, so so again, you know, exercise used as, as an intervention versus um, uh, medicine used as an intervention um, yielded similar results um, for for people, you know, for for high blood pressure. Um, now, the cu- couple of notes on this um, is that you know while this sh- is interesting, um, you know, don't if you're on high blood pressure medication, don't start going to the gym and take go off your medication. Listen to your doctor. So, you know, that's one thing. And two, while while it showed similar results, I think you know the, they make it clear that this all the studies either looked at met it was kind of like either they compare you know each individual study that they met that they that w- was part of this review would be like let's say one study looked at high blood pressure medication versus a placebo or you know, a control group and the other one looked at exercise versus a control group but none of them compared exercise to medication so you just want to be careful with like you know again w- w- if, if you look too deep into a study you might or you, know, or, or you don't look deep enough you'll say oh look exercise is the same and you don't want to go that far there's a lot more that would need to be done you need to do studies that involve both and both versus a placebo or, or, or a control but um you know it does seem to show that you know more than anything just Exercise is important, and, and there are a whole host of health issues that, that um, you can really um, potentially combat um, just by exercising. Nice. All right. Not, okay. All right. <laughs> you, you just want nothing to that, Well, look, no, nothing mm. we don't know. Or yeah, nothing we don't know. Um, all right. Next one. Um, vitamins. D- don't or this one. Uh, next one. Kind of this one is about vitamins dealing with depression. So I didn't realize this uh, until I did a little bit more after I saw the study. I was like, huh. I didn't realize, and I didn't realize how many how many supplements actually um, promote the fact that they treat depression. Um, and uh, there are quite a few out there that that say you know like they, a lot with vitamin D with yeah. folic acid omega three fatty acids say that they're actually useful for treating depression, which you know. It's crazy but again yeah. that's kind of how the supplement industry works they can kind of make these these claims make any claim, yeah. um so this study um included over a thousand overweight people um who were at risk for but not currently dealing with depression um and it covered over a year and so basically half of the people took a supplement that had vitamin d folic acid and omega-3 fatty acids the other half took a placebo um another another note here was that half of the people were also counseled on healthy eating and encouraged to follow a Mediterranean diet. So, a year later, what they found was that there was no difference between um, the between the people who took the supplements and people who took the placebo. Um, and additionally, they found that counseling didn't necessarily help unless the people recommended. I mean, the people met the recommended dose of the counseling. So if they went for the recommended amount of time, they actually did see an improvement um, in the depression. But or 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 you know, um, fewer people 
deal, dealt with depression, but that was if they really followed it. So it kind of showed that there is a certain kind of a, maybe a, like they were referred to it as like a dose response um, dealing with that. So again, another interesting study and free more again about how kind of, again, with supplements, you can kind of get away with saying your thing does whatever you want. Um, as we'll talk a little, I don't know if we get into it as much in the interview, but you, but the book um, that's yeah, based we do on, talk a little, um, little you know, yeah. you can really kind of say what you want. And um, it's kind of scary because I, I didn't realize that there's that many that, 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 purport to you know deal with it and um you know depression is a serious thing and and i think you know it's it's scary that you can kind of just say oh it's got some omega-3s and, and i, I deals think with depression. that uh, that to me that is one of the most unfortunate aspects of uh the supplement industry or the or the homeopathic industry or anything like that are the claims that it makes for people that are, are really suffering depression is one of those it was sort of one of those things that we don't have much of an answer for. Like we don't, you know, we always get the news uh, when so and so celebrity has just uh, committed suicide, and we're shocked. We're like, well, how could this have happened? How, you know, how how could this person be depressed? How could you know this person who had everything? But we know it doesn't work like that. Yeah. In in that person's head, they feel that that's the only way out. And um, there are, uh, you know, there are uh, medications for depression, uh, and a lot of times people will say that taking uh, medications for depressions make them feel like zombies, or they don't feel like themselves. That's a sort of common, uh, you know, com common talking point when it comes to that. Uh, but it's one of those uh, sort of one of Is those that? things. Oh yeah, a lot of people oh, they okay. they'll sure? or, or they'll yeah that, that's sort of a common thing that they don't feel like uh, that that they'll be balanced out, but they don't feel, they don't have. You know, drive. They don't necessarily. They just they feel uh, affectless. Like they don't. They're not. And a lot of them will have. Uh, they have issues. You know, with, with drive. Uh, once again, anecdotal. But that's what a lot of people who have taken antidepressants have. And of course, you know, you could become very much so addicted to antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And um, there's all sorts of other side effects, like uh, uh, you know, sexual side effects and weight gain and and things like that that have been uh, reported with that. So it's a tough it's a tough situation. It's like, what do you do? Do you depress? Do you take medications that that could be addictive and that could have side effects? Um, so it's a, sort of a it's a very tough thing, and we just haven't figured out how to deal with it, and maybe we never will. Well, we, I mean, in some cases we have. I mean, there there are definitely um, <laughs> there's mitigating. There, there, Ways, but it's I mean, there there are. I mean, obviously, with anything, there's not a hundred percent effectiveness. But I think you know one one thing. I think it depends on the severity. But but medications help with plenty of people. I know. I mean, I, I sure, think the reason why no, I ask they is, do. is that um you know I know quite a few who who are uh, save medi lives. Are on medication and, and and are perfectly fine. Yeah, um, there are some, and then sure. there, there are that deal with the, the effects. So I think it's, it's one of things so widespread. Wide it. It's yeah, a very sure. widespread yeah. thing. Well, I think it's more common than I would have uh, yeah. expected, and um, and I think that that's what the the whole thing with with supplements uh, and um, you know holistic medication is, is that people are, are genuinely suffering. And yes, some people have great um, results from taking prescription medications and some don't, yeah. right? And some are just l are looking for a way to relieve their suffering. And you have predators that will, you know, say, take this vitamin or or go and see this spiritual healer, and this person will help. In some cases, it does. In some mm -hmm. cases, well, I think it more than anything, uh, you, you, what, it's what's predatory. Scares, what scares me about something like that, yeah, is like if if you know you have a supplement, um, so you know you, you can kind of you 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 make the claim, okay, well look, this has you know natural, it's natural, it's got folic acid and omega threes, uh, you know, it's natural, not that you know it's not gonna you know it's not gonna have the same side effects as, the, and then they may kind of make the medication out to be something bad, and yeah, then yeah. often. And we kind of look at oh I don't want to be on medication so you, so it's like okay I'll do that and I think that's the, the the scary part for me is that you can kind of make these claims and and there is a bit of you know just in our society we talk about it like when it comes to GMOs where where people just hearing GMO scares people away without them realizing like you know you know there there's nothing wrong you know it's okay organic and, uh, actually scares and, or you me away with the, I know what yeah. the price is going to be yeah. there. <laughs> and you or you, you know here oh well, medication well stay away from you know I don't want to be over medicated and and so I think that has this effect that yeah can can really be really really bad uh, especially for people who are dealing with depression so. yeah i i yeah. i heard uh, a a uh, commercial the other day it was for something for anxiety or or this or that and like one of the big selling points was it's not, you know it's not this is not a medication so you don't have to deal with the side effects this is homeopathic <laughs> and it, you know help you sleep and help you do this and then of course the final thing is you know the the that disclaimer None of this is necessarily <laughs> true. There's no evidence yeah. that backs this up. This is not, yeah. you know, uh, backed up by the FDA, whatever yeah. it is. And so yeah. it's like, oh, great. Yeah, exactly. No. So. 
Well, anyway, <laughs> right, so we'll get to the next study. Um, this one um, is dealing with dietary monitoring. So basically, um, what, you know, kind of a consensus, I, I would think, is that you know, one of the most effective ways to lose weight um, is to monitor your intake of calories. You know, and, and it makes a huge difference. I've experienced it myself with clients. Um, you know, just if you want to lose weight, um, you know, they're keeping track, I think they're, you know, I don't know what the consensus is as far as the, the reasons, but it, I think it's fairly self-explanatory you're you're aware of what you're taking in there's a level of accountability by writing stuff down um and if you're monitoring you're able to kind of make those adjustments where if you're not monitoring it's really easy to either forget what you're having or or actively ignore (laughs) how much you've actually taken in so monitoring really does help but a lot of people do see it as kind of time consuming and tedious and get anxious about it. So for a lot of people, it's almost a non-starter. Like I have this all the time also with clients that, you know, say, right, I, you know, what, what do I got to do? I want to lose some weight. What should I do? And, I, and first thing I'll say is start monitoring what you're doing. You know, my fitness pal, you can write it down. Um, there are a myriad of ways that you can keep track of your diet and it is, you can see it in people. Like it's almost a non-starter. Like they don't want to do it. And so what this was kind of looking at was kind of how so hard as a quick, sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Do you think that it's because not just because it's uh, laborious to do that, which we know is really not that bad because you have apps that could really yeah. help you. It's really only a few minutes, but more so because people know that they're going to have to look at what they're eating and they don't, and that means I, it forces them to change. So, or you really I, think it's just based on the, the fact that yeah, it's a, annoying. It's a great question. I think it's more that it's annoying because even I have that issue like where I don't like the idea of having to do it and it's only when I do it and I'm like, why, why did I care about this? This is so easy. It's just... It's literally seconds, you know, minutes out of the day. So basically what this did is it, there were, uh, this study included 142 people and it occurred over 24 weeks. And so basically the group met weekly online for kind of group sessions with a dietitian, and then they were required to keep track of their, they used um, a web-based app to keep track of what they were, what they were eating. So they recorded the calories, um, they record for all the food and beverages they had, um, they recorded the portion size, they recorded um, their preparation methods if they needed to. And so what they found, um, so, so now for this study, uh, success was categorized as people who lost 10% of their body weight. Uh, and so what they found was that the people that lost 10% of their body weight, by the end of the study, spent 14.6 minutes um, per day recording their food. And, the, you know, interestingly, and, these was, and this was the l- less time than people who were less successful, and what they found was that the frequency of use of the app was more of a predictor of success than the amount of time that, that they were spending on it. So, yeah, well, you know, what I found was interesting is, you know, look, if you, if, if you, anyone who's like, I really want to lose weight, um, if, for, if you can't afford 14.6 minutes or that seems too tedious, then there's a problem. So, cause it's pretty simple, you know, 14 minutes is not bad. Even 20 minutes or a half hour isn't that bad if the, if it, it's for your health and for something that's a really important goal. And I think what's interesting here, my, you know, my thought would be, that the the frequency makes sense because that means that you're really recording everything you're eating. So you're really aware of what you're eating. So the issue that I've seen when I have people record their diets is some people will literally write down every time they eat, they write it down in the moment. You know, I'm drinking water, even their water, I'll, I'll white water. I, I had a Coke, you know, I had a, you know, uh, chicken salad. You know, every time they're eating, they write down, they write down all the ingredients and everything. The people that have a harder time are the ones that will wait till the end of the day. You know, they wait till the end of the day and then they try to mark it all down, but you're always going to forget things or miss things um it's just it's the whole day is worth of food it's hard to remember every little detail so those people to from my perspective the people that were um more frequent in their use they're just more present in their diet they're more aware of what they're having and that kind of presence allowed them to kind of make better choices and and again keep themselves more accountable yeah and I i think you bring up a good point when you say if someone's not willing to spare 15 minutes a day for their health then you know why even you know then you're you're probably not willing to do what it takes to uh, to lose weight and it's and it's just interesting because we we talk a lot about the the sort of assessment of value of, of what someone does it's like the the classic person will be like oh well this you know this avocado is really high in fat or in calories uh, so I'm not gonna eat that but then they eat uh, cake later in the day 
or the. Have you, know, you ever really met somebody that's done have that? Absolutely. Really, that has said, "I'm not going to eat an avocado because it's too fat," but then they go and eat a cake. I have absolutely seen people who you say, "Oh, they know this is high in fat," you know, they'll complain about it, but then later in the day, they'll they'll break down and they'll they'll have something that's just pure junk. <laughs> I also see there's also a lot more so than that, but people that will complain that will complain about spending money on something, say like good quality food or a gym membership, but but will be willing to pay six dollars every day for a coffee mm-hmm. right so their assessment of value when it comes to money for me is 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 twisted it's like so you're you'll spend uh, a, a lot of money on a you know on a coffee which is something that you, you if given a tiny bit of effort you could save the money on but then you're not willing to spend on something that is really good for you so I, I see that happen a little bit more I'm sure you've seen yeah. that in one that way or another me of uh, one of the things my at my very first gym um, the, they were trying to tell us you know all these different sales tactics so one thing they were like all right so what uh, you know, while you're doing your, your session, you know, ask them if they smoke. They say yes. Then ask them how many how many uh, packs a day do they smoke. And so it's like, you know, let's say a person does two a day. And I don't forget. I don't know how much cigarettes are, but let's say it's seven bucks a pack. So you write cigarettes that Cigarettes are a lot more than okay. $7 a pack now. Right, let's say 10 for math. They'll make it easier. All right. So let's say two packs a day. No, let's say one pack a day, 10 bucks a pack, just to make it math, math easy. So then, you know, you, you, you kind of put that in your back pocket. You let them talk, blah, blah, blah. So then when you ask them to buy a set, buy, you know, buy a package, like, oh, I can't afford it. You're like, all right, well, how about this? And you take out a piece of paper and then you do the math here. All right, seven packs a day times ten. That's seventy bucks a, a week. You can you can do one session a week for that same money if you quit smoking. And the, the, it's kind of it's manipulative, and obviously it doesn't work because someone's no. not just going to quit like that. Sure. Uh, but there was kind of that kind of thing where they would they would try to get you to find all the things that they all the bad habits that they spend money on. If they eat out, you kind of do that. Okay, if you eat out, you spend X amount of money, you know, and then how, and, and then you kind of turn it around on them and say, oh well, this unhealthy habit is is worth. Two hundred dollars a week for you. Why can't you afford the fitness? You know, and you try to manipulate, which messed well, up. I wouldn't. Well, do it, it, but. It's funny. It's it's some. It's actually a good um, concept, but done for the wrong. Done reasons. for wrong. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, you, if you're like, okay, well, why don't you take that? money 200 bucks a week and redirect it towards something that helps you but yeah it's totally done in a manipulative way and not in a way that that's realistic because at the end of the day yeah. even if you convince that person that it, it's more valuable to buy the sessions over the cigarettes that's not going to stop them from smoking you, yeah you especially you something you, like cigarettes you don't just, just quit smoking yeah, exactly. you know or whatever it is whatever the bad habit is if you go out and drink you're not just going to stop going out and drinking with your friends like it, it doesn't happen you have to make that decision like you know what i'm done I'm going to spend this money towards something you know more valuable and more useful, but you can't just you know. No, yeah, no, manipulate it you can't manipulate. Something. Something. We just brought so, brought that up. Yeah. All um, right, so uh, what do we got? All right, today? so today we have Christy Ashwanden, and she wrote a uh, a great book. Though I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm going to let you just briefly talk about the book because I haven't read it yet, although I'm going to. Yeah. But you loved it. Yeah, yeah. So so her book is called. Uh, let me get. Yeah, so it's called Good to Go, What the Athlete and All of Us Can Learn from the Strange Science of Recovery. Um, and she talks a lot about this, so I, you know, I won't go too, into too, too much detail. I just say I highly recommend the book um, for a couple of reasons. One, it, it's mostly about kind of recovery um, as far as, you know, and I got to be specific because I, I was mentioning to somebody the other day and I was there, um, like, I was telling about this book and there, I was like, yeah, it's about recovery. Like recovery, like, like alcohol recovery? <laughs> I was like, no, no, yeah, like fitness. It so, like. so it's about kind of recovery when it comes to exercise, which isn't a neglected often neglected or you know, you know just part the a- aspect of our fitness and, and health that we don't think about when it comes to exercise um, but the book itself is really good because it, it goes it not only does it go into the science of recovery and kind of what methods and modalities work but it really more than that it it's it's a science book and, it, and it's about the process. And I think we often, we talk about interesting studies and, you know, we'll always say, oh, a study says this or a study says that. And I think it really does a good job sh- explaining kind of, giving us, a, framing it in a way that we really understand what that means. Like, how are studies designed? What makes a good study? What are things to look at when you're looking at a study? Why is it that we can't just say, oh, that study says, you know, whatever. So that means, you know, you can't just come to conclusions based on one study. So so while there's a lot about recovery, and if you're a fitness person and you're interested in figuring out what works and what doesn't, there's a lot there. I think more than anything, it's a really great book just for somebody who wants to become a little bit more science literate. I think we've talked about it before with with a lot of stuff going on, especially in this country, that, that kind of our science literacy is going down the tubes and I thought and this is a great book even whether or not you're into fitness um, for kind of getting a little bit of an idea of how that process works and um, how to kind of better look at 
studies and how to better understand when somebody says that, you know, something, let's say consensus versus something being kind of an initial study and understanding the difference and, and understanding kind of how to look at look at those things. Um, because it, it our world of fitness is just a wash in that. That's, you know, every week we hear about a new study says this. or And so I think it's a great way to kind of look at the world. But, you know, without more without going on too more, because she does a good job of explaining that as well. Um, and, and as you know, we do this like she's we're getting better, better, kind of bringing on people that we really, really like. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite interviews. Um, you know, she's really great, really great. A lot of great information and we hope to have her back on. But without it further ado. It was great, right? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I got to come up with a better word. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, you, well, you say that uh, Christy, last name, Ashwand. Here's the interview with Christy <laughs> Ashwand. Ashwand, all right. Hey, everyone, we are here with Christy Ashwand. And hey, Christy, how's everything? I'm great, I'm great. Cool, cool. So I'm, I'm just curious, where are you located out of? Yeah, I'm out in Western Colorado. It's actually oh, snowing here today. Really? It's quite beautiful, yeah. yeah. But it's like the beautiful snow, not like the, <laughs> yeah. the gross, slushy, multicolored snow that we get here in New York. <laughs> right, right. It is, although I have to say, I don't know, we've been having a weird winter. Mm, we actually were getting some rain at my house last week, which is mm. terrible. I was oh. not supposed to do that this time of year. So <laughs> it's nice to see it turn nice and pretty white again. Cool. Awesome. So Christy is, uh, is, is the author of Good to Go, What the Athlete in All of Us Can Learn from the Strange Science of Recovery. She is also a freelance science writer, and we're definitely going to uh, be curious about how you got into that. But as we always start uh, off with, we're, we, we like to ask about your background in fitness. Sure, absolutely. I have been a lifelong runner. I started running uh, as a college freshman. I had tried out for the volleyball, and although I'm tall, I was terrible at volleyball. I didn't make the team, and so I went out for the cross-country team instead because they take everyone, and it turned out that I had a natural talent for it. Um, by, the first, uh, by the first race, I was actually the number one runner on my team. I went on to become state champion, and I ran for University of Colorado, um, but while I was there, I got injured, and so I started uh, cycling. So that sort of became my new sport after that, and uh, which was fun. I did that for a while, and I did that fairly seriously. Um, but then I, I also, uh, sort of at a similar time, learned to cross-country ski because I was from New Mexico, but living in Colorado, and skiing was really, really fun. And so then it wasn't until, I guess I was 26, I decided that I wanted to pursue cross-country skiing at a higher level. And so I did that. I was on a sponsored team and I lived and trained in Europe and went all over North America and Europe uh, competing in that. So I've done a little bit of everything and I, um, I don't compete at an elite level anymore, but I still like to go out there and do things. And I'm still trying new sports. I just picked up cyclocross this fall, which was super fun and i'm excited to do that again this year awesome so so i guess because i was going to ask my next question is kind of now that you're not kind of competitively or, or you're not kind of as at as high a level i guess um with athletics what keeps you motivated to kind of exercise stay in shape and and kind of progress well i have to say motivation has definitely changed um i you know i just really love doing these things. I love getting outside. The things that I do most regularly are trail running, cycling, and skiing probably at this point. And I just really enjoy getting out into the outdoors. But I find that it can be hard sometimes. I never, when I was an athlete, ever had any trouble with motivation. And now I find sometimes, so I'll just give you an example. Yesterday, the weather was terrible here. It was sort of slushing, sleeting, just kind of cold and wet. And so I really wanted to go out for a run, but there was just never a nice window to do it. And so <laughs> end of the day came and I'd never run. And yeah. it was like, oh. <laughs> you know, whereas when I was a competitive athlete, you, you know, you go out rain or shine. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I have, I have found that once in a while, the motivation isn't always what it used to be. Yeah, it can be, definitely be a challenge. So I yeah. guess uh, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about a little bit about your um, kind of professional background. I mean, it's extensive. Sure. Um, you lead science writer for um, Five Thirty Eight, and now you've got a, a successful book. So maybe get us into your professional background and kind of what steered you into writing a book. Um, you know, having to do with fitness, but really specifically about about recovery. Yeah, and I'll just say that the book, although it is all about recovery, 
it's really sort of a science book, you know, uh, lurking in there. It's I like to say it's a science book masquerading as a sports book. Um, so my background is in science. Um, I studied biology in college. I thought I was going to go on to become a scientist. And in fact, right after college, I spent several years doing research, working in labs. Um, but I found out, I realized that I sort of enjoyed talking about science and thinking about it and writing about it a lot more than I enjoyed doing it. So I went to this short program at University of California, Santa Cruz um, for science writing and have been a science writer ever since then. Yeah. And I've covered sort of, it's, it's been great because it's given me the opportunity to write about all kinds of science, but it's also given me a chance to sort of merge these two interests. So I've done a lot of writing in my career about sports science and about science as it applies to athletes. Yeah, that, that's great. And it's one of the big takeaways from the book. I, you know, I think it's one of the best, um, one of the best books on fitness that I've read really ever. And, um, I, you know, I read quite often. Um, and I think that's probably it because, you know, in, in addition to the fitness information, which is extensive, I think you use your own kind of personal experience, but more than anything, I think you really describe the process, um, which to a layman is really illuminating. And I, I think a lot of times we, we kind of, you know, even, even me where I, you know, I like to think that I'm, I'm fairly scientifically literate. I'll fall on, Oh, well study said this without really going deep into it. And I think you do a great job of kind of highlighting, you know, the strengths and weaknesses kind of, and, and what to look for when you are trying to research something. And, and I really, you yeah. know, one of the, one of the more interesting parts of, of the book for me was that, was that just understanding that process. Yeah, and no, I'm glad to hear you say that. And you know, I think one of the takeaways of the book, I hope, is that you know, science is the most powerful tool we have for understanding the world. It's the most powerful way we have of understanding you know, how, how fitness works and the science of this. But it's also a really hard thing to do, and it's extremely difficult to get answers to even simple questions that have a lot of certainty. And so you have to understand that uncertainty is sort of an inherent part of the process. And so if you have one study that's showing something that's really interesting and it's worth paying attention to, but we need to understand that most of these studies do not deliver answers that are, you know, have, have absolute certainty and are sort of the final truth. And so we need to be open to being wrong on the way to being right. And what I mean by that, I'll just give you an example from the book. Um, there was a time when we really thought that it was extremely important to have some sort of food and fuel right after exercise. And so the idea was that there was this very narrow window of opportunity or the anabolic window, it was sometimes called, where you really needed to get some protein and, and some energy right at that time. And if you missed that, you weren't going to recover as well. Well, there were some early studies that implied that. And so no one, you know, this wasn't a matter of, of scientists doing bad work or making things up, but it's just that when they, they did follow up studies and they looked at the problem um, a little bit closer and they interrogated some of, of the questions, you know, that they had like, okay, so if there is a window, how narrow is it? And it turns out that it's not so much the timing of this nutrition that matters, but just that that nutrition is happening. So the idea is that you need to fuel your workout and it's important for athletes of all types to get protein. And there's a time when that wasn't something that was well understood where it used to be that, okay, protein was for, you know, gym, gym rats and, and strength exercisers or, you know, bodybuilders and then runners didn't need to worry about protein. They just needed carbohydrates. Now we know that protein is important for everyone, but it now looks like, you know, you, it, you can get that protein throughout the day. And in fact, getting it throughout the day is probably a better way than getting it, you know, loading it right after your workout. Um, and so this is just a matter of our understanding of the science evolving. And so it's not so much that those early understandings were completely wrong. I mean, they were wrong, but it wasn't because science was terrible and was giving us the wrong answer. It's that it was sort of giving us intermediate answers that we needed to sort of continue to probe in order to have a better understanding of things. So I want to ask a follow-up to, to what you were just talking about. If, if you think of something like prescription drugs, they do clinical test after test after test to make sure, and they really follow the scientific method, or else or we hope so at least. Yeah. But with fitness, which is uh, maybe not quite as big of an industry as, as the drug industry, it's still a pretty humongous industry, like billions and billions of dollars. Why is uh, science and the, the research still pretty much in its, uh, I want to say in its infancy, but it's close to it. And why do we still use I I I sort of incorrect terms like we misuse lactic acid? We still right. have these strange rules like no pain, no gain. And every study that comes out is now the, the authority. 
why don't we follow the scientific method when it comes to to fitness? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a, the answer is a little bit complicated. I mean, one is that we have this thirst for knowledge and for ideas. And so um, there's this real interest now among the fitness public of wanting to know this, the latest science. But I think um, some of the responsibility here um, lies with, with communicators of science. And by that, I mean journalists, also some scientists, but in particular, sort of the fitness industry, where science is sort of used as this... Um, veneer of truth where it's like if science has touched this thing it means that it's true and it means that it's powerful and we we sort of give all this credence to things that have have touched upon science in any kind of way and what i mean by that is you have some product or some idea that had a single study or some sort of some scientific thing that suggested something and we just take that as gospel um, but we know that that's not how science works science doesn't pro, pro, you know science does not produce answers that are infallible they produce um, answers that are incremental and that sort of build on, on themselves. Um, but that's not how the marketing goes. And so the marketing goes, oh, there was one study. It doesn't matter that it was really small. It doesn't matter that it was funded by industry. It doesn't matter that you know it was sort of designed in a way to almost guarantee that it would show a positive thing. But you know, we've got a study, and therefore it's true. And I think we need to change our way of thinking about this stuff. Um, and open our minds to the ideas that, you know, we're not, we don't always have all the answers and that science can help us get those answers, but it's a slow process. And, um, you know, just because something's been tested in a study doesn't mean that that's the final answer and it's the most important or powerful thing that you can be doing. And this is really where the marketing comes in. And what I found while researching this book is that so many of the claims that look like science are really just marketing. And so they're using the marketing, or they're using the science as a way of marketing and selling things rather than as a tool for discovery. So, uh, you know, kind of um, to kind of follow up on that, it, what can somebody, let's say the average person, what can they do? Um, like kind of what tools can they arm themselves with to understand like what's, what's marketing, what's science, what's real, what's not, because there is so much information being kind of thrown at us. And even in this, even when it comes to studies, um, there, there are fake, the kind of quote fake journals or, or, you know, situations where, where, it, you know, the average person is not going to understand really maybe the, the right way to go about it or, or who's telling the truth or who's not. So maybe what are some tips that you can give to the average person to, to kind of be able to weed through all the noise and, and try to come to a, you know, a, a somewhat reasonable conclusion? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I wish I had a sort of easier answer. Uh, but the real answer is that it's hard. It's, it's really hard to sift through these things. And it's, it's not easy to just look, even to look at the a study itself and tell, you know, how reliable it is. Um, there are a couple of rules of thumb, though, and that is, you know, small studies produce results that are much less reliable than larger studies. And so one fundamental problem with a lot of the sports science studies is that they tend to be very small. And there are some pretty good reasons for this. It isn't just that researchers don't know about methodology and don't care about, about it, um, but it's just very hard to get good answers from small studies. And small studies tend to produce results that can be misleading, um, oftentimes um, effect sizes that look really big in an initial study will turn out to be much smaller in subsequent studies. Um, so I guess um, another rule of thumb, though, that I would say is that if something sounds like really too good to be true, it probably is. And so it's interesting because in sport, really small differences can be very meaningful, right? Like if you told me that there was something I could do that would give me a 2% advantage, um, that could be the difference between winning and also, you know, being an also ran and you know, an elite race, right? So those those differences are meaningful, but when you're doing a research study, they can be very difficult to tease out from the noise. And what I mean is, it's very difficult to tell whether these differences you're seeing in a study are because of that intervention that you're testing, or if they're due to chance or to do due to other things that can be. Um, altering the effects of, of the study. And so I think that, you know, when, when there are small effects like that, um, you need to be a little bit more skeptical so that even though they may be meaningful and it may be worth paying attention to if it does in fact pan out, um, those smaller differences are um, harder to really test and know with certainty. Cool. So, now so I'll, just, I'll just give you another example. You yeah, know, like we're just, we know, <laughs> we know yeah. that eat, you know, we know that you need energy in order, in order to, exercise. And so we could do a study where, you know, we starved, you know, one group didn't get to eat for two days and the other group ate 
normally. And you know, we, we would probably see a pretty big performance difference between those two, right? And so the fact that we see this big difference is a good good way of knowing that it's real. Whereas if you have something that makes a very small difference, um, it's just much harder to tease out. And so I think mm. that things that are shown to have bigger differences are probably more likely to end up um, having something there than the ones where they're, they're very small. All right. So let's get into the nitty gritty of what the book is about, which yeah. is uh, recovery. So now recovery has become a, a bit of a buzzword as of late. So, and we, you know, we always watch out for those buzzwords, but we know how that it is just so important. And can you uh, explain from a physiological perspective what's important about recovery? Really, you know, tell us about it. Yeah. Um, so the basic concept here is that you can only benefit from training that you're recovering from. So, you know, the idea behind training is that you are applying some stress to your body that your body then responds to by, um, you know, rebuilding itself from the damage that you're inflicting and making itself you know, fitter, faster, stronger. So I lift a weight, I create some little micro damage to the muscles. Um, my body goes in, makes those repairs, and not only does it fix that muscle, but it makes it a little bit stronger than it was before. And so that's the training benefit that we get. That's, that's how we you know, get the results that we're looking for from training. Um, but when you're doing uh, training that is too much where your body is not able to catch up and is not able to do to fix that damage and is not able to sort of replenish itself after uh, the stress that you put it under, then all of a sudden you're not getting those benefits. And instead of getting getting better and getting stronger and all of that, what you're really doing is just sort of breaking everything down. And so that's what makes recovery so important is that it's really the factor that determines how hard you can train. Um, there's, I have a whole chapter in the book about overtraining, and this is something that's actually fairly common among serious athletes, particularly endurance athletes. Um, and the idea here is that you end up training so hard that your body just gets into a hole and all of a sudden your performance plummets, um, and you're no longer able to recover. And this can be not only season ending, but for some athletes, and I talk about one in the book, um, it can even be career ending. And so, um, you know, in order to do this, in order to prevent overtraining, you need to really be paying close attention to how you're responding to the exercise. And you need to make sure um, that you're giving your body uh, the time it needs to rebuild, rebuild. And so the current thinking on this, it's really interesting. Um, you know, we've always called this overtraining syndrome, but there's some new thinking now that what it should really be called is under recovery. And so the concept here is that there's no such thing as overtraining. There's only rec under recovering. So your ability to train is determined by your ability to recover. So it's important to get recovery right because otherwise um, you're really limiting yourself in terms of what you'll get out of your training. All right. So uh, you mentioned uh, many of the, the, you know, the sort of gadgets, the equipment and, and techniques available to help recovery. And I'm also curious uh, to, to maybe throw in uh, – Maybe some supplements and stuff because that's very popular to say, oh, helps you know helps with recovery. You drink this and it you know helps you with recovery. Yeah. Um, uh, can you explain a little bit about what are some of the the myths uh, that are out there with you know, using some of these items to help with recovery? And maybe if there are some that actually really do help. Yeah. So I would say the number one myth that I encountered probably while researching this stuff is the myth of lactic acid, which you kind of alluded to earlier. Um, this is the notion that, you know, when you exercise hard, you build up lactic acid in your muscles and that you need to flush this out and you need to do things to get rid of the lactic acid. Like, in like order take to algae, for instance. Right. Take algae, <laughs> um, take an ice bath, take, there's all kinds. I mean, almost every sort of thing that is marketed for re recovery um, seems to make some claim about lactic acid. But the problem here is that it is absolutely true that when you're exercising with intensity, your muscles create lactic acid. This is a fact. Um, but what isn't true and what we now know is that lactic acid is not the thing that makes you sore. And in fact, it, sometimes your body can even use it as a fuel for more exercise. So it's probably not the demon it's been made out to be. 
But then the second part of this is that your body is actually quite adept of clearing lactic acid from the muscles itself. So by the time you're doing one of these things or using one of these products, that lactic acid is probably already gone. So not only is it not the thing you should be targeting, but it's, you know, whatever this, this thing is, is probably not going to be an effective thing for targeting it because it's, it's already been cleared. Hmm. Now, um, what about some, uh, either some, uh, you know, the gadgets or some techniques that actually help with recovery? Yeah. So I found it was very interesting. So what I found is that there are a lot of claims that are made about recovery things, particularly gadgets um, and products um, that are, are sort of sold using these scientific explanations. So I'll just give you an example. Um, let's talk about Tom Brady's infrared pajamas. <laughs> um, he has these two hundred dollars pajamas that he sell that he endorses. Uh, they're made by Under Armour that are said to use infrared technology. The idea here is that they're um, taking your body heat and reflecting it as infrared radiation. If you remember from physics class, infrared is just another uh, wavelength of yeah. heat. Um, so basically, you know the 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 scientific claims made about the infrared stuff is, is pretty much nonsense. But I'll tell you this, sleep, sleep itself is the most potent recovery tool known to science. And so the sleep is good. Sleeping is good. And if the pajamas help you sleep, then they're absolutely effective. Um, but the claims that are being made about them and the, these sort of scientific claims that are being um, held up as reasons to use this product or the other product, so often those parts don't, don't hold up. And so another thing that I often found is there were things that were genuinely helpful. So I'll just give you another example, which is these pneumatic compression boots. They're sort of like massage pants. If you turn them on and, and they fill up with air and kind of um, massage your muscles, they feel really good. And I'm convinced that these are helpful for recovery, but there are all these claims that are made about them, about how they're flushing stuff out of your muscles and they're increasing circulation and all of this stuff. And those sorts of claims didn't really hold up, but I'll tell you why and how they work is that they make you take 30 minutes out of your day to put your legs up and relax and feel good and sort of at its most basic level, that is recovery. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of recovery is really like unwinding, like giving your body time to rest and recuperate. And so anything that does that works and you don't need some kind of pseudoscientific explanation to make it so. Yeah, it's like the um, the uh, the classic idea of well, if if you take this the, this pill and you cut down to fourteen hundred calories a day, right, you're going to exactly, lose weight. Yeah, right. So it's the pill that works, right? <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. It's just like that. Yeah. And and about the pajamas, it's like, but you know, but Tom Brady said it. He won like, six Super Bowls. It has to be, it has to right. be true, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So, and there is that sort of, you know, so many of these products also um, sort of turn on this FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out. And yeah. they create the sense that there's this idealized version of you that's just one weird trick away. Yeah. And so people have this anxiety that there's just one more weird thing they could be doing that would like bring them to their optimal selves. Meanwhile, you know, they're they're sort of ignoring all of the basics, you know. Just basic good nutrition, sleep, uh, rest, taking rest days, things like this. And so, you know, they, they want the pill or they want the product when, in fact, you know, the magic really lies in mastering the basics, which I'll just say is not as, you know, it may be stuff that we are already all know, but we're actually pretty bad about doing it. And so, you know, you can talk about mastering the basics and say, well, there's nothing new under the sun, but figuring out how to do it and really prioritizing that. I think that we're at a moment where that can be very hard to do. Yeah. I, I train and, and teach um, kickboxing or Muay Thai. And I find uh -huh. that you get a lot of that with um, people who are training who they don't want to learn the basics, but they want to yeah. learn. There's like that one special technique or that one move that's going to, yeah. you know, it's going to win them every fight. And it's like, no, you, you really like, you got to kind of, you know, walk, you know, crawl before you can walk and, and just, you know, getting the basics. But it seems like they want that one tool or that one, you know, strike or that one thing that's going to make everything better yeah. and it seems to be kind of a part just part I embedded in us exactly um, yeah so, absolutely so yeah. now in the book so it's so one of the other takeaways from it was just the and you kind of alluded to a little bit um was it's just the power of placebo and, and for a lot of yeah. it, it seems just like if it feels good it's not you know it may not be scientifically backed but it may be good so maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that and how kind of important that part is to recovery and performance 
Yeah, I found that so many of these products, when they work, um, they they may work in part by the the placebo effect. And this is something that's been studied fairly extensively in the sports research community, where so many of these things that athletes do, not just for recovery, but any sort of you know, performance enhancing stuff, there seems to be some sort of placebo component to it. And one of the things that really points to this is you have these things that maybe individually can give you a two or three or five or 6% difference or, or benefit. But when you add them together, they don't add up to the sum of the parts. And so this sort of suggests that we're sort of tapping into this well of like, you know, our own body's ability to like do things better and our own sort of um, ability to use this expectation effect to our own benefit. And so, you know, we think of the placebo effect so often as being, oh, that means it didn't work. But I think that that's the wrong way of viewing it. Um, the placebo effect is really about um, using your expectations. And so I'll give you an example. If you're doing something that you expect to make you less sore, um, it's very likely that you will feel less sore. And part of this is that um, your soreness from that exercise is sort of um, all of these things added up, you know, the, the things that are actually physiologically going on in your muscle, but also your expectations of how it's going to feel. And there, there's sort of an emotional component to this too. And so if you expect to feel less sore, that can actually change your experience of the soreness and can change the way that you rate it and the way that you experience it. And I think that's okay. You know, in the book, I talk about this NBA team that sort of uses this to their benefit. Um, their trainer says, look, you know, I'm going to give you this choice of different recovery options. Uh, you choose the thing that works for you. Um, we don't know absolutely that any of these things work, but we know that they're helpful for some people and they may be helpful for you. And this is sort of a way of saying like, look, you know, it's up to you. Choose the thing that you expect to work and the thing that appeals to you. And one thing that we know about placebos is that a placebo that someone chooses is more effective than one's, one that's assigned to them. And so that's why this team says, you know, we're not going to tell you which one of these things to do. You pick the one. We also know, you know, th this may explain some of the popular uh, modalities out there. So for instance, ice baths, we know that painful placebos are more uh, powerful than ones that aren't painful. So for instance, a placebo shot is more effective than a placebo pill. And so I think a lot of these things probably exploit some of that as well. Hmm. So uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, before we started the interview that you have a podcast and you mentioned the last one was uh, sort of an existential uh, concept, w which uh, I'm into. You, I think yeah. you called it existential despair, which is basically Ryan's existence because he's a godless wonder. But right, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, our latest, so the podcast is called Emerging Form, and so the idea is this is, you know, you're, you're working on this creative thing and you're waiting for the form of it to emerge. And uh, our, our last episode was about existential despair, which I think every creative person feels at some point, but I think yeah. athletes feel the same thing where you're sort of working on this thing or you're training and you're wondering, will it ever pay off and sure. how is this going to come together? Um, yeah. And we have another episode that I think is really applicable to sports people as well, which is about all about talent. And in fact, so my co-host on the, on the podcast is actually a poet and she and I have this long discussion and I guess you could even say argument about the role of talent. And one of the questions we sort of explore is, can a lack of talent be overcome? And, and you know, what is the role of hard work versus talent and success? And although we're talking about creative endeavors, I think it's it's very applicable to athletic ones as well. So I'm, I'm wondering, are, are like you and your uh, co-host a uh, some weird parallel universe version of me and Ryan? Because like that's sort <laughs> totally. of... Totally. Like ex exactly the stuff that we have talked about you know, that uh -huh. we love to talk about on the gym wits, it, you know. It's, oh, that's great. That's great. True. Yeah, we should have done like a four-way. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh -huh. it's certainly yeah. possible. It's certainly possible. Yeah. And go going back to the whole existential thing, maybe it's a, um, yeah, maybe we're just all trapped in one. Uh, may maybe our lives are one big podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> like right. Some, somehow well, that's the, happening. One of the questions that we explore in the existential despair one is just this idea of like why do we – do these things. And I think this is also true of athletes, right? Like we do these things, like I'm a runner and like I go do these runs that are like all suffering, right? And like, why do we make ourselves do that? And it's part of this sort of, you know, these larger existential questions about life. And I find creative endeavors to be very similar. Um, 
yeah, they're really good ones. You always seem to hit this moment of just like existen existential despair where you think, <laughs> how did I get here? Yeah, <laughs> Why am I, I doing yeah, this? Yeah, we, we do it. I do that, do that all the time, whether it's, whether it's like sporting wise or creatively. Yeah, there, there, there's moments, you have those few moments for me at least where I'm like, wow, I might actually be decent at this. And then far more where you're just sitting down thinking, yeah, why, why do this? What's the point? Yeah, <laughs> it's just painful. Totally. It's depressing. And yeah, exactly. Well, I think the, the general cure for all that is Tom Brady's pajamas. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's so uh, Christy, uh, you're awesome. Uh, you're certainly welcome back on the gym wits at any time. Uh, awesome. And certainly, if you would like to have us on your podcast, you know we, you know, we'd love to come on and you know and chat. I'm that sure could we be could fun. talk. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that. All sorts of uh, funny, cool, awesome stuff. Yeah, we, so we once had an argument. Uh, yeah. our, our worst argument was we were talking about something. Somehow we argued for three hours about whether if you put Coke in a Pepsi bottle, it's still Coke. <laughs> oh yeah, that one goes. That one goes <laughs> way back. That yeah, one goes exactly. way back. <laughs> that's basically been our relationship. <laughs> yeah, oh, pretty much weird. since junior that's high great. school. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's All right. Great. So, Christy, that's where great. can we find you? Yeah, my website is christyashwanden com. I know that's a. a mouthful maybe you can put that in your show notes yeah, yeah well, absolutely. Um, but you can find out all, there's a link to my website and you can find out all about the book at good to www.goodtogobook.com that's probably the best place to find out about the book there are links to ordering it um and also a link to my website and then the, the podcast is called emerging form and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts Awesome. awesome. Well, great. Thanks a lot. We, we really appreciated it. Um, when I, I heard you oh. on um, Fresh Air and I was like, I, we got to have her on the show. Um, <laughs> cool. and, uh, really, thank you for, for coming on. It was great. And Ryan has really touted this book and, and he's read a, a ton of books for the podcast and I'm just like reading through his notes and he's just like, you know, he, he loves it. So now it's like, wow, I have to read this book. Why am I just finding out about it now? <laughs> cool. Cool. Awesome. Great. All right, Christy. Well, enjoy the, uh, the uh, Colorado snow. Thanks. We're hoping... We're hoping that uh, we've seen the last of the snow here in New York, but okay. you know, it, winter winter dies hard here. So yeah, right. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Well, take care. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Christy. Okay. Bye bye. So, do you know that there is a, a pill called Zebo that is a, a, a placebo pill? It, that it openly states that it's a placebo pill and that it helps whatever uh, ails you, whatever you want it to help, it will help. Up until three minutes ago, I didn't know. But then you had the idea for a placebo pill, and then we went on Amazon to look to see if any existed, and sure enough, we found Zebo. So, yes, yes. Yeah. What do you think of the concept of Zebo? I, I mean, <laughs> I, it, well, we know that the, the, the placebo effect is there even if you know it's a placebo, so I guess it's a funny marketing idea, I guess. Like, if you want to, you know, do it, I guess. I, I don't know. Well, look, uh, once again, if, if it helps... Uh, you know, Christy even mentioned the power of the placebo. Look, if it helps relieve some symptoms and some pain, hey, then it's great, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, great interview. Um, you know, we'd certainly love to have Christy back, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk with her again. Um, anything you want to add? No, not much. I mean, it was, I, I would definitely highly recommend the book. Uh, there's lots of great stuff in there. I think she's right because I think for a lot of it, you know, at being in that fitness mindset and being in that mindset of always wanting an edge, wanting to wanting that little bit that's going to make you a little bit better. I was kind of waiting for the the magic pill, even though I know going in that there's no magic pill. I'm kind of waiting for her to say, OK, here's this one thing. Well, that there has is all the there is a magic pill that you it's can take sleep. that will yeah. make you but No, no, no. That, that you yeah. can take that will make you better. Well, sleep for sure. Yeah. Um, only generally you're not allowed to take it, but it will work. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, although but, you'll pay for it on the back end, I guess. Uh, so, so yeah, that I mean, there, there was uh, there, there's that hope, but um, you know, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to it, which, which unfortunately for me is like, I don't get enough sleep and yeah. uh, I feel the effects of it. So, but over the years, I'm slowly getting better, um, chipping away at my at my sleep. Oh, what about there, an idea of a sleep pill? Not a pill that helps you sleep, but will make a claim that there's sleep that it it. That it it gives you the benefits of sleeping while not having to sleep. That would sell like hotcakes off the shelves. Okay, yeah, let's do that. So, right, so just the, have the, to find some clinical ingredients <laughs> and someone to say the that, magic sleep pill. <laughs> sleep pill. Get eight hours of sleep in four hours. Or yeah, that, that there's the there's the idea. It's like so if you could that it it like what what sounds plausible that it 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 adds one third of sleep benefits onto your sleep. 
right? That sounds. We gotta like a good word number, it in right? a way that it's gotta be clear, like what we mean. Like okay, so so it's like yeah, basically. No, I think you gotta say get 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 eight hours of sleep in half the time. In that sounds too good to be true. So we, the way you sell Maybe it, like, right? But, like six hours. But so you of really sleep you really eight. have to put the doom into it. So like when you sell it initially, you've got to talk about how the horrible. Um, effects of not getting sleep, which there are many, like being you know ca- kind of chronically sleep deprived is is awful for the body, awful for you mentally, long term has awful effects. You and don't you, forget how terrible really, the prescription medications really iron, are too. Forget that. So you really iron home how bad it is to not get sleep, and then we you know then we push our product that you know you can get you know in four hours of sleep you get the benefits of eight hours of sleep. Yeah, I think it's uh, we'd make we'd be millionaires. I think it's a good idea. All right, cool. Would um would you guys be upset at us if we came up with a product like that? <laughs> Are you waiting for an answer? Uh, I was just waiting, for, yeah, maybe for someone to like p- jump through the, uh, the, the screen, the screen and, smack and like oh. smack me. But um, look, so well, here's the thing. Look, if you could make like millions and millions of dollars off of peddling uh, something like that, would you? I don't know. Uh, if I, I would have to find a way to morally justify it. So right, if I can make so if it doesn't do any harm, okay, and I can right. make millions of dollars, and then I could turn around and put that money not look i need some for myself but but i could put a significant amount of money into helping others then i guess if you look at it from kind of like a utilitarian perspective then then maybe i can justify so it. for a greater good so like I, I if it was a if it really caused serious harm which i guess theoretically it would because you'd make people think that they can get four hours of sleep but they can't so they they would well no because i think this is marketed to people who are they're going to get four hours of sleep anyway yeah. so you're just giving them it's a placebo so actually it might be doing good <laughs> <laughs> so so maybe, so actually i might be doing good on both ends and then i'll take a lot of the money that i make a good deal like and put it back to good causes so yes <laughs> I've justified it. All right, all right. Well, let's get on it because I think we we I think we figured it out. We figured it out. We, we cracked the code. All right. If all anyone, right. Uh, if you have any any scientists out there that want to help us come up with a uh, a scientifically proven um, formula for this uh, new magic pill, please let us know. We'll uh, we'll give you. And 6%. any lawyers that can give us advice on dealing with the FDA lawsuits and all that no, stuff. All you have to do is say it's not. Um, claims are not. Uh, you know, refute. You know, are not made by the FDA. You know, or are not backed by the FDA. Yeah. All you have to do is... But, but we still have to... You know, at some point, they'll come to us if, if, it, if it shows to not work, and then they'll be like, hey, um, yeah, you got to... That, that claim is well, BS. Well, the person just wasn't using the pill rod properly. No, then they'll, ha- they'll want science... Like, they, they, we, you know, we have to... At some point, we're going to have to prove something. Or, or do we just become millionaires quick, and then we just take the product off the market? Uh, I, th- I think that, w- that we, once we make the money, then we'll change the product. Okay. Fair to enough. to to something else that that will take them a while to like come after us again. And then we so we could keep sort of changing the product and, and whatnot. I think it's keep a good cycle idea. going. All right, cool, awesome. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> <sighs> this went on maybe like. Three minutes too long. As always. Okay. All right. Well, as usual, all our stuff is at thegymwits.com. Um, hopefully, you didn't tune in just to that last part where you think we're like immoral, horrible people. Um, I, really not. <laughs> but anyway, um, Ryan George. I'm Justin Guild, a.k.a. Chef Sonic, reminding you that truth does not sell, but magic sleep pills just <laughs> <laughs> We are the Gymwits. Gymwits.